15th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Detol, Banega Swast India. And we are at the Bank of Baroda Mughal Ten. We're delighted to introduce Minding the Mind, Mining the Mind. This session is presented by Rajasthan Patrika. In addition to an illustrious career as a writer, television producer, documentary filmmaker, Rajiv Mehrotra has been a personal student of His Holiness the Dalai Lama for four decades and manages as secretary and trustee the Foundation for Universal Responsibility established with the Nobel Peace Prize. A remarkable, a remarkable and a multifaceted figure of our times, Mehrotra speaks frequently on His Holiness, Buddhism, interfaith harmony, and issues pertaining to media. He has authored and edited several acclaimed books, including The Mind of the Guru, Conversations with the Spiritual Masters, Understanding the Dalai Lama, The Open Frame Reader, Unreeling the Documentary Film, and Conversations with the Dalai Lama on Life, Living, and Happiness. As an independent documentary filmmaker, commissioning editor and producer, Merotra has won 32 national awards from the president of India. In the spirit of In Conversation, the iconic talk show of which he was the host for decades, Merotra discusses his myriad pursuit with writer Devapriya Roy. Devapriya is the author of three best-selling novels, The Vague Woman's Handbook, The Weight Loss Club, and The Friends from College. In 2015, she published The Heat and Dust Project, co-written by Saurabh Jha, which debuted at number one on the Hindustan Times. A. C. Nelson List, Roy published Indira in 2018, a unique graphic biography of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in collaboration with Priya Kurian. She's currently translating Tagore's Gora into English. Both of them will be signing their go, uh, books after the session. Grab your copies from the bookshop and they'll be here. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to this, what I hope is going to be a very illuminating session. Good God. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty of light all around us, so that should take care of it. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, but I'm, I'm delighted to do this and we have an intimate uh, audience, which is wonderful. So we'll open it up for questions uh, also soon so that, you know, it's, we're all in it together. So, you know, I'm going to begin with a confession. I, I uh, whenever I open a book, I read the dedication first. I have a thing for dedications, okay? And I'm going to read out the dedication of this one. Okay, he's written so many books, as you know, The Mind of the Guru. And I'll, with your liberty, I will read it out. Do I have a choice? <laughs> no. <laughs> So this book is dedicated to my teachers, Rajiv writes, my root guru, His Holiness Dalai Lama, BKS Iyengar, the late Swami Ranganathananda, the memory of my parents, Har Narayan and Shanti Mehrotra and Sharda Gopinath, and to my wife, best friend and fellow traveler, Minakshi Gopinath. This seemed to me to be, you know, uh, the map that a, uh, young spiritual seeker followed. Absolutely. <laughs> will, you, will you tell us a little bit about this? Because we've got, and also if you'll explain what root guru means. Sorry, what means? What, what root guru means. Oh, okay. Um, I started my sort of quest in a sense, uh, holding my dad's little finger. When uh, growing up, we used to go to lectures and you will know at Gold Park, in Calcutta, the Ramakrishna mission, and uh, things sort of fell apart. I went to study in England in uh, the mid-70s uh, when uh, the subculture of the time was at its peak. Right. Uh, I was at Oxford. I wasn't very good at academics, and so I plunged in at the deep end of uh, 
uh, life in the theater and all that went with it. Hmm. Uh, uh, and none of which will uh, I answer any questions about. And uh, so the day, uh, uh, the last day of term, when I, uh, after my sort of final year, I rushed back home, uh, you know, confused and in quite a mess. And I ended up in, uh, uh, at the Ramakrishna Mission in Delhi. And, uh, there so was this a, is the one in Paharganj, is it? That's right. That's right. At the Ramakrishna Mission. And there was a very kindly Swamiji there then called uh, Swami Bodhananda. And Swami Bodhananda Ji said, look, I don't know what to say to you. Your mind is so fragmented and frazzled that all I can suggest is that you listen to music. And of course, at that time, we were listening to a different kind of music for those who are uh, you know, aware of the music of that time, which is probably being a, a greater aggravator uh, to a frazzled state of mind. Anyway, be that, be that as it may, the, the initial journey uh, continued with uh, the Ramakrishna mission. And I went to uh, Swami Ranganathananda Ji Maharaj, as we uh, described him mm. in, in so Calcutta. Who is, uh, uh, so was Swami Ji the... At that time, the head of the... Uh, Swami Bodhananda was the head of the Ramakrishna Mission in uh, Delhi, Delhi. And Swami Ranganathananda was in Hyderabad and who I had grown up with. Mm. So when I was calm enough to travel to Hyderabad, I went in to see him. Mm. And I received uh, in, in, in the terms of the mission what they call Diksha. Diksha. Uh, which is a, a kind of minor initiation mm. uh, where you're given a, a sacred word and, and some guidelines by the master. Uh, over the years with my uh, uh, practice and, and working with uh, Swami Ranganathananda Ji Maharaj, um, uh, not widely known for those of you who are familiar uh, with the Ramakrishna mission and, and, and we call him in, in Calcutta Thakur mm -hmm. and Thakur's uh, writings and philosophy. Uh, Thakur was basically a bhakta, I mean a, a devotee who followed the, the traditions of uh, devotion. And, but Vivekananda, who is his, uh, yes. his primary disciple, yes. uh, uh, often said that Ramakrishna was my master and uh, the Buddha was my Ishta. Oh. And Ishta is like the core deity uh, or, or figure that you worship and learn from. And uh, uh, Swami Ranganathananda was a Jnana Yogi and that's where sort of it, it merges into Buddhism in some ways. Mm. And... Uh, so we used to talk a lot about the Buddha, and he said that you know, like like with Swamiji, uh, and I'm not quite you know equipped uh, to take you the entire journey. I think your path is with Buddhism, and it was truly remarkable, uh, and, and and a great testimony to India's inclusiveness. And I think the Ramakrishna Mission, like His Holiness, is a wonderful example of that. And uh, so, in I wrote off a letter to the Dalai Lama saying mm -hmm. I wanted to see him. And which year are we in now? And we are now in about 78. 78. And uh, so I heard back uh, from him or from his office to say, I'd like to see you. And somehow it didn't work out and nor was my life working out. So I went off to Colombia to right. study film. To study film, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, so I had an interesting sort of journey. I did science in school, English literature at St. Stephen's and um, economics and politics at Oxford and film. And it's wonderful because, <laughs> precisely because you did all these different things that the books have come out in the, in the way they have. Uh, they answer so many of our questions from this time, you know. So I came back uh, to uh, India and uh, there's two, three, three friends of mine uh, and there is uh, who were, and uh, one of them is an IS officer posted in uh, as a district magistrate in Kalpa. And since Punita I is see. here, she will probably I know see. him Vivek Shivastav and Radhika Singh and Sanjay Acharya. Three friends of mine were in Kalpa. And uh, you know, Kalpa is in Himachal, bordering uh, Radak. And so His Holiness was traveling to through uh, the longer route to Ladakh and stopped by in Kalpa and with his entourage and walked into the room and uh, he looks at these three gentlemen and said, oh, do you know Rajiv? And uh, so they said, of course, yes. And I had this frantic trunk call to say, you know, oh the great God. man is asking after you, where are you? <laughs> and so I met him and that started the journey with Buddhism. 
But I do want to flag what was truly remarkable and significant and very gratifying for me uh, was that uh, Swami Ranganathananda and uh, His Holiness became very good friends. And so uh, His Holiness visited Belur, Swamiji went to Dharamsala. I had the great privilege of moderating a discussion between them. And, uh, and so uh, the, the, His Holiness became my sort of root guru. And a root guru really is someone that who is your primary source of teaching and inspiration. And, uh, and particularly when you uh, uh, are part of a tradition that encourages you to learn from all traditions. Right. So it's sort of like, you know, you come back home each time. Right. And to a teacher, uh, like His Holiness, uh, who will say, and it's a byline we carry in a program, multi-faith program we are learning, uh, we are sort of uh, hosting, uh, where he says that uh, we must learn and respect all religions and traditions while respecting our own. And so that's where the concept of root guru, certainly in our tradition, comes up. And, uh, and also that you can go to other lamas and learn from them. Mm. And uh, when I'm talking too much, just stop me. Uh, <laughs> I'm fascinated. <laughs> uh, because... Um, for example, well, His Holiness is 86 now, but when he was still, mm. you know, in his early eight, till his early 80s, mm. he would still receive oral instructions and teachings from lamas younger than himself. So that tradition of learning would continue, Absolutely. but you would still have your root right. guru. Right. So um, that brings me to Thakur, his biography of Sri Ramakrishna. And being a Calcutta girl myself, of course, I used to go to the Gold Park Ram Krishna Mission Library. Um, and, you know, the synchronicity of these things, my current obsession is uh, translating Gora, which is set in Calcutta at exactly that time. And the debates in its pages are all about, uh, you know, the Brahmos and uh, the Sanatanis at the time. And of course, a lot of reform was happening and so on. It was the time when Sri Ramakrishna emerged and in his extraordinary sort of way, and you have captured it so, so brilliantly because this book also speaks to our generation, to a rational mind, even though you, you give us the frame of reference to understand him, but that frame of reference is not, um, is, is not it cannot be scientifically quantified, right? So, Will you talk a little bit about, you know, um, about, about Thakur and how you see him? Well, you know, Thakur sort of in, 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 a, in a very sort of gradual manner burst among, upon the firmament and sort of encouraged and supported very eloquently by Swami Vivekananda. Though he takes uh, Thakur's teachings in a somewhat different direction, you know, with an emphasis on, um, on, on, on the Vedanta. Basically on the Vedanta, and you know, the service follows from that. You know, my passion for Ramakrishna was really born uh, as a seeker, as a student. And uh, I, I always felt that the great strength of India's civilizational heritage was the juxtaposition of wisdom with method. Right. And so, right. Uh, you know, uh, at some places, uh, Swamiji talks about it, and certainly it's inherent in Buddhism that we go through uh, knowledge or intellectual understanding. First knowledge, then understanding wisdom, and then finally realization when it begins to impact our deepest reflexive responses. Uh, and it is only right. when, we, right. when it, it impacts our deepest reflexive responses that it becomes real and transforming. Uh -huh. So you can listen to an eloquent speaker, be very right. impressed by the ideas and right. think about them and yet not be transformed. Right. So the right. genius... And your own reflexes, oh my God. And so, and, and so the genius of Thakur was twofold, or manyfold. <laughs> and that was really that uh, he was amongst the first teachers, I think in history, as far as I can tell, uh, to some degree the Buddha, but we never really knew what the Buddha's enlightenment experience was. We knew the method that he followed right. till he sat under the Bodhi tree. Right. But uh, Thakur consciously chose to engage in the sadhanas, the methods of the different traditions of Hinduism itself. Right. Dvaita, right. Dvaita, Tantra, etc. Right. 
And then he didn't stop there. And this is where the great sort of Absolutely. celebration of uh, Thakur really happens, that he stepped out of the temple precincts and created a little kutir, a cottage, where he engaged in the practices of Islam. Of Islam? <clears throat> and Christianity. And Christianity. And in full public view. So when someone of that position does something in public, uh, it is a very conscious choice and a message that he is sending out at, at a particular time in history, which my, by Jove uh, is so valid and relevant today. today. And that is what this is connected with his holiness. And so the Dalai Lama will also today say that each one of us has a different mental disposition. And so we need a different mental diet. And if you just begin to look at the idea of a mental diet as a physical diet, the parallels are so easy to understand. You know, if you're born in a particular context, particular climate, particular culture, you will like chilies or fish, or you will be a vegetarian or what have you. So similarly, your minds need a different mental diet. Right. And so for me, that was what drew me to uh, Thakur. Thakur. And I found that the, the, this is all from secondary sources, obviously, mm. but none of the great biographies, and there are some great biographies, Christopher Isherwood and uh, uh, has, has done Max Miller, mm. but none of them had really sought to document or write about the method. The method, absolutely. And the other thing that was, you know, that I had heard about because when you grow up in Bengal, you hear these stories, but you 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 also with all the secondary research and all established it, that one of the one of the uh, one of his teachers, the one who instructed him in method was Bhairabi, was uh, a, a, a woman, female, a woman a, and a in Tantra. And a, and tantra. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and in full public view. And in full public view. And uh, so there's a uh, the other thing which really spoke to me was uh, was something that you've recorded here that Vivekananda bore a sort of testimony to his guru's um, mind and because he himself came from a rationalist position he would argue he would that his witness is very very important today also right so do you want to talk a little bit about, about these two sort of, uh, so uh, Thakur and Swamiji and Swamiji and Nivedita? Well, you know, I haven't researched uh, and studied a great deal about Nivedita, I have to confess. And so she doesn't figure uh, prominently right. in the book, right, right. but certainly Swamiji, yes. Mm. And uh, I think that uh, when we talk about wisdom, experience and realization, mm -hmm. so uh, here was the Gyani, who had surrendered to a bhakta and who was looking for experience, for realization. And so he so desperately reaches out to Thakur and says, I want the experience. So do and you want to just sort of tell our audience <laughs> the difference? Okay. So, you know, when I was a child, uh, you, you remember those old history books and there would be a chapter on the Buddha and there would be this line and then under the Bodhi tree, he received enlightenment. And I remember asking everybody, but what happened? Nobody could tell me that, right? What happens? Well, nobody can tell you that. That's the whole point of it. And hence, well, when we say nobody can tell you that, uh, I heard in the previous speaker talking a little bit about use of poetry and music and the non-conceptual experience. So what, what our traditions really teach us and hence, I keep underlying method is that, for, well, let me tell you my story, uh, you know, related uh, to his holiness on this aspect of uh, what happens. So it's been 40 years since I've been uh, studying with, uh, with his holiness and, and uh, you know, the timelines are not exact, but something like five years, seven years into practice. And I'm not a very regular practitioner, but you know, I struggle and I engage and I fail and I carry on. And I used to say to the, his holiness, but nothing is happening. You know, it's been five years. And or I'd go in and report that, you know, I had this experience of expansiveness or, you know, sort of uh, my third eye was throbbing or where the third eye is supposed to be. And he would just completely ignore what I was saying. But I was very sort of persistent on this because I needed, like most people, the assurance that my journey and unfolding on the path was yielding results because we're all trained to be looking for outcomes. 
that we can tangibly right. and consciously right. identify. Right. And uh, so, uh, you know, one very sort of difficult morning, I pushed, 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 pushed. He said, you will never know when something is happening. Because if you know, your ah. evolution and growth will stop. Because right. it will stop at where you think. And when you think that you have had insight, wisdom, or a transforming experience, or however you choose to describe it. So uh, great masters and great teachers, A, will never seek to define what is happening because it is a non-conceptual experience. And when pushed to explain this, I often say, look, I cannot even explain to you what coffee tastes like unless you have tasted it. And you are expecting a great teacher to tell you what enlightenment, whatever that is, and I will not seek to try and explain it, uh, can be explained to you. And this is something that in, in, in today's times, uh, the, 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 the seeking of, uh, uh, you know, the being a, uh, a traveler on the path, that is the greatest challenge, uh, that we are trained to look at tangible, concrete outcomes. So that has led to a dilution of the method. Right. right. So that... Right. You get outcomes, and which you know we we believe are sort of more anesthetics. So where you feel calm, you feel relaxed, you de-stress, for the only purpose and reason that you can do more of what is causing it in the first place. Does that sort of answer your question? Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, so, you know, we've been, we've been talking about the Dalai Lama. I recently read a very interesting story uh, about him. This was by the Dr. Larry Brilliant. Mm -hmm. when, uh, when he was, uh, so he was a devotee of Neem Karoli Baba. And, uh, and he was working on the, uh, the smallpox eradication program for the World Health Organization. So his wife, Girija, and he, they were traveling around India. And small villages where they would go to see what's happening so in one such village, they stayed, or, or in a forest, they had stayed in an awful guest house. So they, were, they hadn't had a bath and all of that, and they were just yearning for a better a bed to sleep on. So then somebody tells them there's a government guest house somewhere down the road. Mm -hmm. They reach at night, mm -hmm. and apparently there was a you know, stringent hierarchy. So if there wasn't anyone more important than you, then you could get a room. So they get a room, and they take a bath, and they are sitting there. They're thinking we won the lottery. Then one of the sort of, you know, uh, staff members working there rush in and say, you have to go. They say, why? I said, a very big VIP is coming. You have to go. They were like, where do we go? We, we, we're not going anywhere. And who walks in? The Dalai Lama. It, it's still the 70s. He's young. And he immediately divines what the situation is, that these two people are about to be evicted. So he just says, sit. And, and, they, and, and he talks to them and, and Brilliant has written about it quite brilliantly. Mm -hmm. And of course, Brilliant was busy uh, with the vaccination program. So he, he saw that the, uh, the, the mark, master right. himself yes, had yes, 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 these yes. marks. So he talked about it. And, and then at night, the Dalai Lama said, it's fine. We'll share the bed. Mm -hmm. uh, because you know the, the perception was that, that he's a Buddhist monk. Uh, all of that. And it was an extraordinary story. And of course, there's a, there's a humorous sort of epilogue to it that Dalai Lama, uh, that Larry Brilliant writes that the next morning he left. Uh, he writes that, you know, uh, it, it's believed that once a pickpocket met a great saint mm -hmm. and he only saw the saint's pocket. So here was <laughs> I meeting this great uh, saint and I was only looking for at his vaccination <laughs> marks. But uh, yeah, and this gave me a, you know, the, the, the joy and the life, right? It's not separate from us. It's in every moment of the Dalai Lama's life. But you know, the, 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 the important thing is that again, we somehow begin to feel that uh, if we are uh, awakened, enlightened, whatever word you want to use, uh, somehow uh, the suffering will disappear or pain will disappear. 
and that you will not, uh, you'll, you know, you will be in a constant state of ecstasy or bliss. Uh, again, these are all sort of euphemisms. And I think that the, uh, 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 we, we see this in Thakur, we see, and there are a lot of parallels. And I just want to flag that when His Holiness was speaking on Vivekananda Ji's uh, centenary, he said, look, I this, this idea of, uh, of you know, affirming uh, celebration of diversity, he said, I got from Ramakrishna. Uh, you know, as 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 uh, as as, and of course, he does them more uh, as much as as gestures. So he will go to places of worship of different faiths. He'll go to a mosque right. and uh, right. wear the skull cap and do what have right. you. Right. And uh, so I, I think that uh, the 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 teaching of the I'll just go back a step. So when the Buddha attained enlightenment, mm -hmm. whatever happened under the tree, and we just label it enlightenment for want of a, a description, and he came out, he was confused. He didn't know what to do because it was a non-conceptual experience. Right. But, uh, and, right. and also when the Buddha was dying and, and people said, you know, were mourning his passage and saying, now where will be the source of our dharma? And he said, well, whatever I have taught has sometimes been contradictory because it has been positioned for different people and their uh, degrees of interest and learning. And it must stand up to the scrutiny of reason, logic, and experience. That's where the science comes in, in uh, Swami uh, Vivekananda. Mm. And so what, what we, when we try and explain what enlightenment may be, uh, without the actual felt experience of it being translatable, it is uh, uh, an insight into the true nature of reality. Right. Whatever that reality is, or it's many layers and dimensions. And so what the Buddha uh, uh, sought to explain uh, was that uh, uh, suffering, and actually he used Dukkha, which is more unsatisfactoriness rather than suffering per se, mm -hmm. uh, is a part of the human condition. And we will all experience uh, some form of uh, you know, pain and suffering, and it's reasonable. I mean, uh, you know, when my mother was dying, I went to see his holiness and I was crying. It, you know, it was the first death in the family. And so he just, he shed a few tears. And he said, you know, go out and meditate on death. Because that is the nature of reality. So the, the, the challenge for us is that because reality is so, uh, to our reflex response, unpleasant. Right. We don't want to confront and see reality as it is. And right. so when it strikes us, or we confront it or experience it, our equilibrium is lost. So to go back to why uh, the Dalai Lama experiences uh, or manifests and transmits joy, it doesn't mean that he doesn't feel pain right. or he doesn't feel suffering. Right. Uh, a, a, a one way we describe it is to say that he suffers, but he doesn't experience the suffering of suffering. So, right. and, and again, when we look, uh, you know, for me, it's fascinating often to go back and forth between Thakur and uh, the, you know, the Buddhist ideas, is that, don't forget that when uh, Thakur was dying of cancer, mm. he was experiencing mm. pain. Mm. And Christ on the cross was experiencing pain. And they both had the capacity to reach out to the divine uh, for that pain to be brought to closure or to end. The idea came up for them, but they pulled back. Because it's part of their evolution and journey, the experience of the suffering of suffering, till you got the realization that that was the true nature of reality, was crucial. Because if that process had been short-circuited mm -hmm. by the divine, mm -hmm. or whatever you wish to, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we don't want to get into a discussion mm -hmm. on what is divinity, mm -hmm. but whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. Uh, that uh, your evolution uh, would not be complete. Right. So uh, the Dalai Lama sees reality as it is. Uh, of course, he denies that he is a bodhisattva. Or a yes, bodhisattva, I, and I, he I just says that. that you know I'm a simple Buddhist, Buddhist monk. monk. But uh, you know we who you know look up to him as as, as the teacher uh, do believe that he is one. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, well, one. Uh, one quick question, and then we'll 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 hear from our audience. Um, you know, you began with the words frazzled, fragmented that Swami Bodhananda told you. 
And that's something that all of us day to day, we deal with. I particularly, I, I'm fairly frazzled. <laughs> Will you, I'm asking for a magic mantra now that, you know, what is this one thing to do? That will... I have no idea. If I did, I mean, I mean, I still feel frazzled and I still feel fragmented. And if I had that magic mantra, I would call upon it right now. <laughs> but in gen generally speaking, that are very important uh, from uh, all traditions. Uh, there, there are two, two aspects, I think, to, for there must be a zillion, but to come up for me right now is the enormous value of uh, training the mind. And the mind, like the body, uh, needs and can be, not just the body, but different facets of the mind can be trained. Mm. And it always, uh, you know, it's uh, at my very mundane level as a, as a practitioner, uh, what I do do, I have to say, that I do dedicate myself to trying to train the mind. I'm not mm. saying I train the mind. Right. Uh, and is that I spend a, a significant part of the day, by my standards, in trying to do that. Mm. Uh, and it, it occurred to me after sort of I, uh, after my sort of uh, collapse, as it were, uh, that um, uh, we spend so much time in training ourselves. At that time, it was to be a theater director, or to be a scientist, or to look beautiful, or to look handsome, or for our professions or for the, the sporting skills we want to have. If you're rich and, and can afford to play golf, your golf swing, yes. or whatever yes. else it is. Huh. We invest so much time in those elements of it or to be able to write well, uh, but we uh, don't consider training the mind to be a priority at all. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, in the current political dispensation, we're constantly talking about uh, India's civilizational heritage. And today, uh, His Holiness has made this one of his passions, is to uh, see how we can bring back in a contemporary vocabulary, uh, and I'll tell you what we mean by contemporary vocabulary, uh, India's traditional uh, methods of uh, training the mind. Mm -hmm. And what we mean by contemporary vocabulary is that when you draw on the Buddhist tradition, I mean, here is a man who says, don't take my word as final subjected to reason and logic. And hence, over the centuries, Buddhism has, con it's no longer Buddhism in the sense as it was at the time of the Buddha. It has continued to evolve by subsequent generations of practitioners and who came under the larger ambit of Buddhism, whose treaties and writings we treat as texts today. Right. And, and so the vocabulary of uh, Buddhism is very easily put aside uh, in order to look at the method. The other day, for example, and I, I'm going to take two minutes to talk about this, even though it's not a question, because it's seminal uh, to, uh, please, you know, to, 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 the, to, to the Dalai Lama and the aspiration. And so we did a meditation uh, the three, four days ago on uh, compassion and the nurturing and cultivation of compassion, how to train your mind to be compassionate. And why compassion? Not because it will earn you brownie points in heaven, but because we know from traditional psychology and modern psychology that people who suffer or experience intense suffering and certainly suffering of the mind or even experience the suffering of the body uh, beyond uh, reasonable um, uh, uh, context, uh, are obsessed with the I, me, mind. Right. And in some ways, the human predicament is the obsession with I, me, mind. And so if you cultivate and nurture the practice of uh, compassion, the sense of the self that suffers softens. And the minute you begin to think of somebody else, your own experience, experience of suffering, not the fact of suffering, diminishes. Right. And so what, we, so to what the method really is, and, 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 and the prerequisite for the method in a sense, and this is where fragmentation comes in, is that you have to have the ability using whatever methodology, whether it is you know, breathing or yoga, there are many methods available in our traditions to be able to concentrate the mind. Now you can concentrate the mind when you want to get your lipstick right, <laughs> and your hand doesn't shake when you're putting on, eye, putting on your eyelashes. 
Now that's a form of concentration. And, uh, but if we can extend that commitment to concentration, to training our minds, because without that concentration as a prerequisite, mm -hmm. that's where listening to music comes in. If you can't focus on anything, focus on music as a method mm -hmm. of focusing the mind and then build on it. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, yoga and the other traditions are many different methods of enhancing the ability to focus and concentrate the mind. Mm -hmm. Now that ability to train the mind to concentrate is universally valuable. And some of the Indian art traditions will tell you just the fact of concentration of being able to sort of take away the fragmentation of your mind will bring you some calm and composure. Compassion and concentration, <laughs> the two things. Should we take some Absolutely. questions from the audience? Well, uh, okay, there is a lady there. Yes, please. Um, then we'll come back up front. Hi. I know you said diets are individualistic, but could you share a little bit about your diet? And uh, I will pass it. I would, you mean my mental diet, my physical diet? I don't want to. Yes, of course. My physical diet, I don't want to talk about. The results are obvious. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. You have a related question? Uh, sort of. Yes, please. Uh, so I was in the session with Honey Ogre I took uh, on the foundation. Uh, talk ah, yes, of course. Yes, 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 yes. My uh, question, sir, is about uh, children and sometimes the brutal adverse childhood experiences that they undergo and the, the difference between knowing and, and healing uh, the, the thesis that you alluded to uh, in terms of when uh, and particularly about insight uh, and the younger the child that we are working with and we have been working on the transformation of uh, some of the stuff that we have articulated uh, in the manner that it applies to very young children, particularly preschoolers. So when we speak about the difference of the mind that I would like to hear your thoughts about how uh, the kind of journey that you are taking, how that applies uh, to children who experience and endure mental predicament. You know, I'll have to be honest and say, as far as you know, about children, I know very little. I mean, I could sort of hypothesize, but I don't honestly have the experience. And I think our friend Hani Oberoi is really the best person. However, uh, I can sort of talk about some general principles which will apply to everybody, including uh, you know, children who are traumatized or who are struggling. And some of these, uh, well, I'll just answer your question about you know, my uh, mental diet. And you know, my mental diet, I'm afraid, is you know, because I'm still, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a struggling, I describe myself as a, a struggling sadhika. Uh, I've promoted myself from student to sadhika. And so uh, it's, it's like my physical diet. Sometimes it's a hot potch potch. And, uh, you know, we do receive, uh, uh, you know, once you formally uh, become a student of a master, you get a, you get a transmission, uh, like in from Swami Ranganathan, I got a diksha, which was a particular mantra that you keep, you know, repeating to yourself. I don't know if this is the context of space to talk about mantras and maybe get into that kind of uh, uh, discussion. Uh, but so what, uh, what the teacher does is he describes, uh, he prescribes a mental diet that he considers appropriate for you. And that mental diet has many elements. And uh, so the basis of uh, meditation, uh, as we see it, is, you know, we say vipassana, shamatha, mindfulness. Uh, th 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 these are all phrases which have gained very popular currency. There's nothing wrong with them, uh, except that we believe that they are sort of, uh, uh, sort of anesthetics that uh, prepare, the body, prepare the mind uh, to be able to go the next stage. Because without content uh, that uh, uh, impacts the mind, uh, uh, realization will not happen. Now, uh, let me just dwell on the process, if I may, a little bit. And, you know, we, we use the word mind very loosely. And, you know, the series you're talking about, and I recommend it to anybody who wants to watch, is called Healing Our Minds, 
you know, multi-faith, multidisciplinary approaches. How does Islam look at it? How does Christianity look at it? How do different traditions look at healing our minds? But what is the mind? Uh, uh, and this will obviously have to be, you know, there are whole sort of long treaties written on the nature of the mind. But essentially, the mind is what mediates the brain, which processes sensory experience and translates them into uh, uh, sensations, feelings, or what have you. And the mind, which mediates the space between the brain and consciousness, consciousness as an awareness. This is sort of roughly put, of course, in Hinduism, we don't have consciousness in the way we understand it in Buddhism. Consciousness is actually, it's called the Atman, it's the soul. Right. But common to these three elements, something that we can understand in terms of the modern dynamic and modern understanding. I don't know who to look at. I'll look at you. That's easier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that, you know, every thought uh, that we have uh, or every experience creates an imprint in our consciousness, in our uh, brain. Uh, at the level of both biochemistry mm -hmm. and uh, psychologically mm -hmm. uh, in the, the mind. Mm -hmm. And so each subsequent action or, or response or feeling uh, is because of what has been imprinted in our, in our minds predisposes us to a certain response. It's like, you know, if we eat acidic food, you feel acidity and that will be your response to it. So just imagine an accumulation of all these imprints of every uh, and, and this is an important distinction that you know, we draw on our tradition, that uh, when we talk about karma, what is karma? Mm -hmm. Karma is the imprint on our consciousness, but it is not the imprint of our actions, as is commonly uh, spoken about, but of our intention. Right. So it is the intention right. behind an action, the motivation, right. Right. Uh, that creates the imprint. So if, I'm, if I, am, I have to tell a lie to a, uh, you know, a group of people looking for uh, someone of another faith who I am hiding and saying, I have no one here, the intent to have told a lie, the intention is larger than myself. So the imprint in my consciousness will be a positive one. Right. So, uh, right. and again, the positive and negative is not our gradations. Hmm. So what a mental diet is doing really in, in meditation is through what we call analytical meditation, we consciously plant imprints in our consciousness will, that will predispose us to uh, what happens in the future. Mm. So example, if we, want to, if we want to nurture compassion, mm. and this is part of what we did in our practice the other day, mm. uh, we, you know, we visualize and we feel, for example, in our communities, uh, mother's love or the love of a partner, right. or a, your pet. Right. And uh, the emotion it creates in us, and then we juxtapose the uh, person we love with someone neutral, and then the enemy. So can we can, for at right. least for a moment, right. feel the same feeling of compassion that softens the self, and imprint that on our consciousness. Right. So there are many analytical meditations that enable us to think through processes, arrive at conclusions that will imprint our consciousness. So uh, Punita will be happy to know. So one of the meditations we did that day was of gratitude to acknowledge that we were here at the Jaipur Literary Festival and to recognize interdependence to the number of people whose contribution made this possible. Not just that. So to go back to my favorite analogy of coffee, even the coffee we were drinking, to acknowledge the person who grew the coffee, who planted the coffee, who brewed it, who brought it here for us. Now, if we keep repeating these calibrated thought processes, the idea that my happiness, my existence depends on each one of you here, will automatically change my relationship with you. So this is how we try and impact the reflex response. Right. And to the other question uh, about uh, children, and this is one of the sort of uh, more challenging areas uh, because um, in our traditions in the East, we take reincarnation for granted. And we are able to work with the assumption of reincarnation. Whereas if we were to take this matrix out into the West, mm -hmm. it usually becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. 
because it needs to be argued, it needs mm. to be explained. Mm. And while it can be, it's a convoluted argument, which I only partially understand, we will not dare to go into that here. But then what, uh, in, in reincarnation too, there is a difference in the way Buddhists look at it and mm. uh, the Hindu traditions look mm. at it, uh, except to some degree in, 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 in the, uh, the, the, the non-duality school, is that we don't believe in a, in, a, in, a, in a single soul, a single strand of continuity uh, mm. of the soul. So those of you who have read Herman Hesse's Siddhartha, seen the movie, and if you haven't, I recommend it. It's an old movie uh, by, uh, again, Punita will know, uh, the husband of a very dear friend of ours who made that film, Conrad Rooks. And so he uses the analogy of the river. Mm -hmm. And so the river is continuity, and yet there isn't a single strand in it. It's ever changing, but it's the same river. Right. And it carries the hallmarks of what happens upstream, downstream. Right. So downstream is our present existence. Mm. So in the case of children, there are two, two, two sort of two matrix that operate. Obviously, there is the carry forward of what happened in their last lives and imprints that they are carrying into this life, mm. which can be antidoted. Uh, we also have this wonderful notion of antidotes can be antidoted by parenting, by care and oh, by the manner right. in which we right. can try and impact the mental diet that they process. Mm -hmm. I mean, it cannot be sort of complete and definitive. That's been a long answer. We're out of time. We are out of time, but that, well, I think we'll take one more question. Can sure. I just ask one? Sorry, Raji. <laughs> this is about your personal journey. How did you resolve the external contradictions between the, you spoke about methodology. So Thakur's completely, you know, sublime surrender to, the Ma, the Kali, the Kinesh, all that, and the rational and scientific thing that you know, the Dalai Lama propagates. How do you resolve those? I mean, they seem contradictory. Well, you know, that's 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 the whole uh, how to put it. That's the whole point in a sense that they appear contradictory. And if you just look at uh, Vivekananda, uh, sort of articulated it so beautifully, and he said that each one of us. I mean, he, of course, categorized it so it would be accessible. So he said, karma yoga, bhakti -bhak yoga, raja yoga, jnana yoga. So, and, and nobody really is, follows an absolute archetype. And in the same way that uh, uh, you learn from all of them. So if you have two minutes, I'll, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Yes, please. Because the, the, the aspect of bhakti. And uh, is that in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, as in the Hindu tradition, we have deities. But there is a difference between how we in Buddhism look at the deity and how Hinduism looks at the deity. But what is common to both of them? Why do we have a, a, a zillion deities? Can anybody tell me why we have so many deities? Yes. Because we have so many people? Okay. Okay. It's, it's that, but it's... it's, it's I, I got it. It's what you're saying is that everything is interconnected and equally reverential. And equally reverential, but it's much more nuanced and specific than that. And why do we have a th thousand forms of Lord Ganesha itself? And how does that happen? That happens because the you know the, the through through millennia, teachers evolved archetypical images that would serve as our mental diet and then began to tweak them. So at a very gross level, uh, His Holiness felt that, say, I was very shy and reticent. So he urged that I practice with a wrathful deity oh. so that the qualities of the deity would create imprints in my consciousness. So every deity uh, is tweaked by a master. So someone will give you a threshold. Mm -hmm. And in another deity, the trishul is taken away. And, 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 and when, 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 a, when a master is designing, in a sense, or modifying a deity for you, a curriculum, well put, she's the teacher. <laughs> the, the, the deity will be tweaked to meet your particular psychosomatic needs. And even at the gross level, we know that particular colors have a psychological impact. So, for example, I am working with a deity that is red because it's to energize me and give me courage. And for the same reason, you have a red light. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody who's very wrathful and needs to calm down mm -hmm. may get blue or right. white, right. or depending what it is, 
and every element in it. It's not just an abstract symbol. And that is, you know, whether it's Eric Fromm's sort of, you know, the universal consciousness, what are they? What are those symbols? Those symbols represent particular mind states. So the use of deities is hereby reversed. Right, right. But the significant difference is that in, in, in our tradition, again, uh, saying to make it, I mean, not consciously to make it, but makes it more accessible is that we create the deity as we meditate. So, you know, from out of Shunya, and that's another discussion for another day. I mean, Shunya is not emptiness. Shunya is not nothingness. I will not try and explain it because I only partially understand it myself. But so you create the deity from your mind's projection. You work with it and then you dissolve it. Whereas in Hinduism, we believe that the deity for all practical purposes actually exists. exists right. But we still pray to the deity, we still supplicate to the deity, but the deity is the creation of our minds and our relationship to the deity is arising. Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to now make you answer this one question because um, somebody has won something, partner, okay. we've got partner content winners and uh, the, the prize was that you would answer their question, Rajiv. So you what? have, yes, so you have to now answer this question. All what? right. Okay. 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 <laughs> well, yes. Uh, so this is uh, from Ashi Sharma, and he asks that today, you know, when um, life is so hectic, uh, there are so many things that keep running in our minds. Um, but beneath that, there are these, uh, you know, depths of illusions. How do you balance? That's the question. I'm not making it up. <laughs> Goodness, I, uh, uh, we have delusions beneath all, well, we are deluded because we don't see the true nature of reality. Hmm. And uh, in order to s see the true nature of reality, we have to engage with, uh, uh, you know, what we call in, in Buddhist terms, Sutra and Tantra. And Tantra is not just sexuality, Tantra is method and sutra is wisdom. Mm. And so wisdom will tell you, as I was illustrating, that uh, we are all interdependent. Now, tantra, which is the practice, which I talked about exchanging oneself with others, will help you realize it so you see and experience that reality. Right. And unless we work at both these levels, we can talk through doomsday about what is and what shouldn't be. And that is one of the reasons why as a species, we're not able to respond to what's happening with climate change because we're talking about it and we're not yet pausing to actually experience the impact of climate change. And the transformation hasn't happened. Our reflexes are still the same. Right. right. Um, okay. I think we are we're very much out of time. So I want to really thank what our audience. We've had a wonderful audience. It's a hot afternoon. So thank you so much for being here, being here so present, so mindful. And, uh, and thank you, Rajiv. And thank you for being so indulgent. Oh, yeah. thank, you. thank you, Rajiv and uh, Deva Priya for a very engaging conversation, which uh, I think has brought a lot of wisdom to the JLF this season. And I think, except for answering your original question, we stand wiser for everything, which is what is enlightenment. And, but uh, I think that's a quest that we will continue with. We also thank uh, Rajasthan Patrika for support in this session. Thank you very much. It was a privilege to have both of you talk. Raji will be signing uh, his books, right? And they will be.